This week on the Marketplace of Ideas, part one of our new special series on the future of books and reading. Conversations with Daniel Meneker and Odile Israelson, host and executive producer of the newest book show around, Title Page. Odile oh, Israelson is the founder, or should I say the co-founder and co-executive producer of the newest book show around, and I believe the first book television show, or rather book web television show, to hit the internet airwaves, you could call them, title page. Odile, oh, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Now take us back to the earliest days of the idea of title page. How did you come up with the idea of a new book show in 2008? You know, truth is, Colin, that I, this is an old idea that, that I've had for a long time. I, I'm originally from Belgium. I came about 25 years ago. And I grew up with a show called Apostrophe, um, which was hosted by a gentleman called Bernard Pivot. And basically watched that show for many, many years. It was the most popular show on French television at the time. And I loved it and watched it every week. So, and for the last 25 years, I wondered why there was no Bernard Pivot and no Apostrophe in the U.S. And so time went by, and this old idea became fresher as suddenly the Internet opened um, a very different landscape for all of us. Because this is an idea that obviously is not going to attract millions of viewers. And traditional broadcasters are not too keen on, you know, following up or putting their money in these kind of programming. And suddenly the Internet basically gave us an opportunity to try something like that. Now, why do you think there was no equivalent in non-Francophone countries of that show? Why was it just in those regions of the world that that show succeeded? <laughs> you know, I'm not sure. It's interesting. I think partly it's a question of habit. I think it's uh, French, uh, you know, French culture is very conducive to discussions or... I wouldn't call them intellectual ideas, but giving in ideas a more prominent position, I would think, in the mass media. I think you have these kind of shows. You've had these kind of shows in, in Great Britain for quite a while also. I think it's just, you know, I think originally if we go back to the origins, a little bit of television, if you look at uh, how the media came about in the U.S., basically a product of Procter & Gamble, while on the continent, it was mainly, I would say, you know, considered a public public service, public broadcasting service. I think that's where it comes from. It's not really different. I think it's a rating, a rating issue more than anything else. Because when you look around, you see universities where you're at. I'm sure you have a lot of discussions, a lot of um, book writers who come by. Uh, they're just not exposed. They're just not brought on, you know, in the mass media. That's just the only difference. It's not that people, Americans don't like to, to read or that they don't like to talk. I think it's just that nobody thinks about it as something, you know, know valuable on television. You mentioned that the idea of Title Page or of, of making an, a, a book show that's like the one you so enjoyed in Belgium. How long have you been trying to do that? You say it's an old idea. Has it been ever since the days you were originally watching the first show that you thought, I want to make this again? Mm -hmm. You know, honestly, it's really for the last 25 years that I've been here, I've basically thought, why doesn't it exist? Uh, so the idea as such has been in my head for a very long time. But I didn't have, I would say, the professional experience to do it, and again, the, the means of distribution to do it. Then a couple of years ago, I was doing a consulting job in Dubai, in the Middle East, and worked on different projects that had... Uh, much more studio, studio work, which I'd never done before. I've been basically a producer in the field for many, many years and never had done work, you know, in depth in the studios. And so I didn't really see how I could make it happen before. And after I came back from Dubai in uh, 2003, to, uh, 2005, actually, and the net was taking, you know, such a... The net has changed so rapidly in the last few years it suddenly fell into place. I suddenly thought, oh, my God, we can actually brought it. We can do it. 
But then I have to say there was <laughs> the actual part of doing it, which was also to find somebody, a host, you know, because the genius of, of Apostrophe was also mainly Bernard Pivot, the host, <laughs> and to find somebody who could be not only a brain, but somebody that authors would feel comfortable talking to, and that was the second challenge. It took about a year and a half, more than a year and a half, two years to find actually Daniel Menneker, who's you know, who was the perfect fit for the show. Tell me a little bit more about that search for a host. Now, Daniel Menneker, I mean, I've seen all the episodes of the show so far, and he does a great job, but how hard was it to find him? It wasn't easy, and, and, and I won't lie to you. We, we approached a couple of more other people before we, we got to him, and, you know, I was basically scanning a lot of the, the trade publications about who was doing what, who was who, because I'm not a publishing person at all, and I really always felt that to be successful, the show should have somebody who authors, again, would feel comfortable and um, who would give credibility to the show. That, you know, a lot of people who would come and watch would be book fans, book lovers, and they would not go for, for somebody who didn't have any knowledge, basically, of literature. So I was, I was truly looking in that direction originally. So at some point, I saw that, Daniel Maneker basically was leaving Random House and wrote him a letter and approached him mainly to become like the editor-in-chief of the show, like the content, the person who would find the books, who would be the brain uh, behind it. I didn't think of him as a presenter at all. And my co-producer and myself had lunch with him. And in the course of the lunch, and you know, if you ask him, he'll tell you exactly the story. The more we talked and the more it became apparent that he would be very interested in hosting the show. And that's, that's how it came about, basically. What qualities, what personal qualities that he has emerged to you that said this guy is going to be a good host? The main thing was a bit like uh, exactly what you're doing. I think he was a great listener. As we sat you know, with him at, at, at lunch, he listened to us very carefully. He was... He had a warmth, you know, originally, if I may share that secret also, we were looking for somebody a little bit younger, a little bit uh, that could attract a younger type of audience. But Dan is somebody who has a lot of, uh, of warmth uh, in person, and I hope it comes across actually on screen. I think it does. And so we, we got totally like, we basically, you know, we organized an audition with him, and we put him in front of a camera, and we saw that he had every quality possible by then to actually uh, to be a great host. It is hard for him. Don't take me wrong. I think it's he's not a professional host. He's not somebody who's done, you know, interviews uh, for the last 30 years in front of a camera. So it takes, uh, it takes a lot of practice, and hopefully we can keep on practicing for a long time. And I think the more he's going to do it, then the easiest it's going to become for him. Tell me about the hassles or the advantages, whatever the positives or the negatives are, of doing an Internet television show, because that is uncharted territory, pretty much. I mean, you're going in there almost blind because so few people have done it before you. What, what have you found has been the pros and cons? You know, it's an interesting question. I think the different level, exactly as you're saying, the pluses and the minuses. The, the big plus, I really feel, at every level, is that you have a, a very direct, interaction with the audience um, because people can watch it and comment and email to you so rapidly. I think that's, that's to me, the big plus. It's also that we didn't, you know, need to go through the traditional uh, distribution networks and, and try to sell something that didn't, would not have made sense to a lot of people. And uh, we can target directly, basically, the people who are interested in these kind of, of programming. All that is the big plus. The minus at, at <laughs> and that's almost a personal level, I would say, is that in addition to producing the show, in addition to organ organizing the show, you have to handle the web part of it. And as simple as the website looks, it takes a lot of work. So it's an additional, a whole additional uh, layer of, um, of manpower that you need basically to handle it. And I'm sure you know, because you do have the same experience with your podcast. It's, you know, there's one thing to do the interview, you know, to clean it up, <laughs> edit it, and then you've got to put it on and follow it. And people are asking more and more for uh, analytics in terms of what you're doing on the web, etc. So it's, it's an additional part. 
But the really nice side of it is that direct contact with the people you're trying to reach. Now, speaking of that direct contact, I wanted to find out of the viewer feedback you've been getting, and I assume there's been a lot because I see a lot of discussion about the show on the Internet, of the, the criticisms and of the uh, positive stuff that's been said, too. Has that influenced the way the show has been, has been made? Has that changed the way you're doing the show, the viewer feedback you've gotten so far? You know, very honestly, maybe not as much as, as it should. And I'm, I'm saying that in very... Uh, being cautious about what I'm saying, because the reality is we had always thought about these for this first season, the six shows, as a trial period almost for us as, as the team, which is we went in with a certain vision, a certain look, a certain feel, and a certain format. And we didn't want to change it along the way just you know because of comments, good or bad. And for one reason is that I think it's very hard to find out what works if you don't try it for a certain period of time. I think if you look on TV and you see these shows that come up for, you know, two episodes and then disappear, it's, I would say, unfair. And as we know, the old story, the Seinfeld episode, nobody, you know, everybody thought it should be pulled out, and then turns out it became a great success. I think one has to get used to a certain format as a viewer, and the only way we can actually try a certain format is by keeping it on for a certain amount of time. But if you watch the episode, there are things that have changed. For example, there's a table now that wasn't there. You know, and that people may think it's a change that came, <laughs> came about because of viewers' uh, feedback. Truth is, we wanted a table originally. We couldn't find a table originally. It turned out on the third episode, we could find the right table. So these are things. As I say, everything that's there is there for a reason. Sometimes for a good reason or a bad reason, but rarely because of feedback we've had up to now. Any viewer who watches the first five episodes that are up now, they'll watch the earlier ones, and they'll be able to see these changes you mentioned happen you know, before their eyes as they watch one, two, three, four, and five. And it, it improves. I think everyone would agree that it gets better as it goes along. But I agree. After, after you watched the first or second episodes, you watched them with the team, and I assume you were all looking for what you needed to change. And what did you all see that you wanted to alter after you saw the first completed episodes? Let me tell you a little bit on the production side. We shot the first episode, episode second. The second episode you saw was shot first. The third and fourth episode were shot on the same day. The fifth and sixth episode were shot on the same day. So certain things that people think they're seeing changing are not because they were basically shot on the same day. And the changes that you saw between first and second were not, uh, again, chronological. Um, what I think was the main thing we changed after number two was the opening. The opening didn't work for us at all. We had Dan in front of the camera. It was pretty stiff, and it didn't give the kind of energy that we wanted to give, and we've changed that with something, you know, kind of a moving camera opening with the guests coming in, being mics, and I think that brought another level of energy um, to the show. The second part was also the, the lighting. And, I'm, you know, these are all tiny details for people watching maybe, but for us they were big. From the beginning we wanted a very wide background and we couldn't get them. You know, in the studio the engineer we were talking to could not see what we were seeing and we couldn't get the wide background. So on episode four... This, you're finally seeing, I think, the white backgrounds that we were looking for from the beginning. For the rest, we've practiced in, the, in terms of the format and the discussion. We've, we're stuck, I think, more or less to the same thing, which is the guests are there to talk to us about their books. So the first part of the show is mainly about them introducing their books. And the second part is, uh, is uh, Dan opening up to different topics, uh, depending on what the guests have talked about, you know, while presenting their their, their latest work or um, based on things that we thought about prior to the show, basically. You've brought up a couple issues here of visual style of the show, and that's something yes. I wanted to be sure to ask about. It's, it has a distinct style, the show does, and you'll see certain things on it you don't see in other TV shows. For example, the cameras move, there's, there's close-ups you don't see, like a profile shot of Dan occasionally that you don't see of any other host on TV. How did the visual style of the show come together? You know, it's a very particular style because we that's what we wanted. And I know it's a bit different and a bit special, but this is something that we 
we truly intended on. And I know for some people it's a very hard, uh, it's a bit of a, a shock almost, but um, I think it's, it has an inspiration. There's two, two parts to this. The first one is uh, I watch a lot of European television. My co-producer watches a lot of world television. And so we've, we've come, I think, to, um, to be inspired by things that come from all over the place. And I think there are many different styles that you don't see in the U.S. that we find interesting and a little bit more um, avant-garde, I would say, and that we wanted to bring to, a sh to the show. Also partly because we, didn't, we were not too keen on having something that would look like a library or a bookstore that people would expect to see in a certain way in a bookshop. Also, we thought, and, and I think that's important to us, that a lot of people would end up downloading the episodes to their iPod. And wide shots, in many ways, don't work that well on an iPod. So we're shooting very tight so that somebody who's looking it on a small screen is not, you know, can actually hear the authors as well by, you know, reading their lips as, you know, from the picture on the screen, basically. So there are these two parts. And you mentioned European television, and this podcast and radio show, of course, gets heard primarily in America. There's European European audience as well. But what what are these stylistic qualities of European TV that you wanted to to use for your own show? As I'm saying, there is something a little bit about you know the tightness of the shot. They're in general a bit tighter, and it's a style that you would see here on 60 Minutes, I would say, but you don't see much on regular television. The moving camera is also the panning of the camera is something that you don't see as much here that you see a lot in, um, in European television. Also, the speed of the cuts in a talk show. It's cut pretty rapidly, which, again, is quite different. Here, you, ha you often have three or four cameras with a steady shot, basically, on the, on the person who's talking. Here, we try to, go, to do a lot of reverse shots also about the, the, the other guests, which sometimes actually causes us a bit of trouble because, you know, the other guests, guests don't seem as involved in the conversation <laughs> as, you know, you might think or you might hope. Um, but this is all little elements at the end of the day that makes for a different sense of aesthetics. I personally feel that the content of the show is what should dominate and that we're still doing a book show with a, you know, with a certain content and that the aesthetics is just some kind of, um, just a background, really. Uh, either you get involved into what the, you know, the authors are talking about or you, or you don't. Uh, whatever we put you know, in front and the back should not matter that much. I mean, it's just like, that's a, almost like an exercise, I would think, on the production side. Now let's talk a little bit about the content of the show, the conversational style of the show. It's, it's come along as everything else has since the first few episodes. There's originally, from what I remember, it was mostly one-on-one -on -one talking between Dan and the, an individual author. And then for a little while at the end, it broke out to group conversation. There's been an increase in group conversation. Has that been a goal to bring that up? This part, I think, is, is, is almost more work in progress of anything else. I think we started with, with somebody, as I mentioned, who is not a professional interviewer. And that, that means that it takes a little bit more work maybe to get down to a certain format. We, I, I don't think we've pinpointed yet the exact rhythm that we'd like to reach. There is definitely the first part um, is very, to me, almost fundamental. It's like, I, I, you know, it's, I, I don't really care to hear some an, anybody talk about anything if I don't know who they are and why they would talk to me about certain things. So you have to set them up in the first part of the show. So, and in this case, in particular, they, they invited uh, really because they've written a great book and a book that we'd like you know, everybody to know about. So the first part will, is and will remain the talking about the book. There is no doubt about it. Also, and it might be a, unclear to a lot of people who've been watching the show, but we're not thematic at all. We pick a theme basically after the fact. We pick the books because we want these books because we think they would they'd be very interesting. We're not afraid of mission, you know, mixing fiction with nonfiction. It doesn't really matter. So in a certain way, the conversation that comes about after the presentation of the book is not obvious, or it's not something that would be automatically natural, I think. And there, it's a little bit... We're both the guests, and the balance between the guests and the host 
has to come together. And that's, I think, it's part of the work that we have to keep on doing that, uh, that will you know, make us get better as we go along. Tell us a little bit about the process by which the authors, by which the books are selected. How do you go about that? Trust me, Colin, it's not a science. That's the first part. Uh, the second part is really we set up a little database um, that tries to, to track down the books that are coming out from all over the place, and it's, it's become quite a big database, I would say. And then um, we sit together, and the together is uh, Dan, uh, John Williams, our online editor, uh, Lena Mata, my co-producer, and myself in a room on a Monday afternoon, and we go through that database and look at what books we'd be interested in for the next, you know, episode, basically. And, and we discuss, and there are different tastes in the room, different levels of, you know, intellectual levels, I would say, and different consideration in terms of another a couple of criteria. We want the books to be timely. Uh, which means that when we, we'd like them to come to be published within two weeks, three weeks of the air date of the episode. So that's one big criteria. Everything else that doesn't fall into that almost falls, you know, aside. Um, and then we truly we try to put together, find four books that we think could be interesting and would be interesting to an audience um, that shares, again, the different... Um, you know, qualities that we we are, you know, with different levels of, of reading, different levels of interest, et cetera, et cetera. Then we have to have the guests to accept our, <laughs> our oh, of course, invitation. Of course. That's also something to consider is if they actually want to fly out. And has that, has that been an issue where a guest is sort of hesitant to come all the way there if they're not from New York? Or? You know, honestly, that's been the marvelous part of the, about this is that we've, we've had absolutely no uh, resistance whatsoever to, to coming on the show. And we've had people, you know, really go out of their way to appear. Um, so this has been fantastic. I think we, we, we've really gotten, you know, 90% of the authors we wanted. If The only reasons we haven't had somebody is basically because of conflicts, state conflicts or different things like that. Now, when you talk about the team getting together and deciding what sort of books they'd like to see on the show, it made me think of what visions people on the team have for the show. And is everybody basically going for the same thing? They all want the same thing for title page? Or is there a variety of opinions on what the show should become? It's interesting. I think it's a question maybe that uh, you'll, you'll ask Dan. Um, I would say, and I might be a little bit naive, yeah, but I would say we're 90% on the same wavelength, which is we'd like to become, you know, a place where people come to find inspiration about what to read. Uh, we'd like to become a place where people, you know, would like to sit for an hour and listen to an interesting conversation. It feels like they've heard something they haven't heard somewhere else. We'd like to present books of all varieties, but where the quality dominates, uh, which is we want good books. And be they, you know, comic books or children's books, whatever down the road it is. So it's, I think all these parts, we, we're totally on the, on the same wavelength. Um, there might be a little bit uh, of discussion on the format as, you were, as we were talking before. Uh, and that's, I think that's something will evolve as we evolve on the production side and the comfort side of everybody involved. And, and I think that's the reality for anything that you, that you do. Uh, a particular talk show, you become more skilled, you find out new ideas, you, you have other people coming along giving you, um, you know, feedback, all these things. So, but I think on the, the idea of becoming a place that title page will be, you know, in two years, a place that people truly come and click on to see, oh, what did they have, which guests did they have, oh, is this book interesting? I think we're all on, on, on the same page. On the subject of books and of reading, it's something that comes up in various articles in newspapers and on blogs and trend pieces and whatnot that, you know, the old saw that nobody reads anymore, that the book is dying and what have you. Now, there are many perspectives on this, and I was wondering, uh, for yourself and for the title page crew, is the show a work of, of optimism, of faith in books and reading, and of, of harnessing the fact that people do read, or is it a show that's more informed by trying to 
bring reading back and bring, bring books back to the mainstream? When you're saying that, I don't feel a sense of mission either way, if I may say. I, I find that this is, um, at least for me, it is truly something that um, it's a pleasure project in many ways. I think people who read or used to read um, know the pleasure you have when you read something that, that, that's great, that makes you feel good, in which, you know, that uh, truly reveals worlds that you're, you're unaware of, uh, ideas, thoughts, feelings. But, and, and again, that's, that's personal. I'm like a lot of people. I've I've started reading less and less as as I've <laughs> as I've evolved in life because I, I often don't really have the time. But also, I didn't find many I would say sources of information where I, that I could rely on that would pull me in some direction or another. Which means that every time I I walk in a bookstore, I'm so overwhelmed that 90% of the time I walk out without a, a book in my hand. And that is the goal for me. It is not. Uh, it's basically to tease and titillate people's minds. Um, I don't think people read that much less. I think the publishing industry doesn't do that badly at the end of the day. There's, you know, it's a twenty-four billion dollar industry. Um, I think there is a lot of money there. I think people read less because they have less time. They read less books, but I think we're all reading a lot, and we read online, and we read, you know, magazines. There are so many sources of reading. So it's not like I think we should, um, again, personally, at least I'm not on a mission in one way or the other. I just want to, you know, try to share some pleasure with other people and find good sources, uh, good books that everybody would like to read if they have the time and, uh, and, and filter out, you know, this mega amount of information that we're surrounded by. The show in that sense is, is a project to spread the joy of reading to uh give people more of a roadmap to what's best in the book world? I think it's that. I think, you know, <laughs> there's also a little something and a little frustration in my mind. I, I see that, you know, you know the uh, hairdressers or eyebrows, pluckers uh, are celebrities in, in, in today's world. <laughs> I have a hard time getting that, personally. I don't understand why authors... Uh, are not made a bit more of a celebrity. And I, I, I know this would shock some of your listeners that, you know, uh, the celebrity sense. But I think it's a little bit sad that, you know, a lot of people don't know what Philip Roth looked like. Uh, I find it uh, a little bit sad that uh, the ideas of Noam Chomsky's are not more exposed. Not because they're good or bad, but because they don't keep in, you know, the the world in which we live as much as other things. So there is a part of that. So the joy, the pleasure, uh, it's a mix of things that we'd like to accomplish, I feel. And truthfully, I think there's an audience out there. Uh, there's a lot of people who care about ideas. There's a lot of people who love, you know, taking a book and, and reading. I take the train regularly. I see a lot of people spend their time reading. I don't see that many, uh, you know, iPods or, or games and so I think there's, uh, there's a lot of people like us. That's the bottom line. And it seems like from what I've seen so far, they're starting to definitely discover Title Page. So, Odile, thanks so much for coming on the program. You're so sweet. Thank you so much, Colin. It's something that's music that you got to touch and feel. You know what I'm saying? Daniel Menneker is a former fiction editor at The New Yorker and senior editor at Random House. He's now the host of the newest book show around, the first book web television show, Title Page. Daniel, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. It's good to be, to be here. Now, we'll get into the finer details of becoming a TV host in a few minutes, but first I want to find out how did you initially get approached to join the Title Page team? Uh, well, um... Uh, the two uh, people whose original idea it was, both of them film and television producers, Odile Israelson and Lena Mata, um, one from um, Belgium and one from Lebanon, uh, and internationally experienced, uh, had this idea to model a book show in America somewhat after apostrophe or apostrophes, the French, long-running French book conversation show. And um, they just called me up, I think, for advice about whom to approach. And we had lunch, and I did my best to entertain them. Uh, I figured I almost felt like I was auditioning because I wanted to give it a try myself. And 
about 20 or 30 minutes into the lunch, they said, would you like to try it? And I said, sure. I've only been sort of, you know, performing for half an hour. Um, um, I thought you'd never ask. How much experience did you have performing live in front of, if maybe not a TV audience, maybe not an internet audience, but in front of any, any audience in your career to that point? Depends on what you mean by performance. I was a teacher for five years after graduating from college, and I've taught uh, occasionally since then. And even while I worked at The New Yorker and at Random House, from time to time I would moderate panels at the book fairs or I would uh, give a speech myself or I would answer audience questions. So uh, put it this way, I wasn't in completely inexperienced, but the idea of actually running a program um, was new to me. How much did the experience you just described, how much did it give you in terms of preparation for what was to come on title page? About 20%. Oh, that's not too much. No, 80% was new. 80%, the, the rest of the 80% had to do with camera consciousness, sound consciousness, um, trying to um, uh, compromise between spontaneity and having questions set up in advance, how to be in the moment, as they say, um, and how um, to uh, do a lot of, different kinds of things that I hadn't thought about before, the sum total of which is to be what I call artificially natural. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about the preparation you had to do to become a, a TV host, because you've become a good one. You can't tell you haven't had a career as a TV host up to that point, but what did you look to? What examples did you... Well, you're very kind. I, I, I Out of modesty, but also genuine... Uh, uncertainty. I would disagree with you about uh, your assessment of my work, at least in the first two or three programs. I think we all improved as time went on, and the last two went particularly well, five and six, and we're now hoping to start again in the fall. The models that I know are the ones that we all know. I mean, the ones from watching television, people all the way from Tim Russert and Charlie Rose to even Regis and and Letterman and people like that, there is a real skill. And I, I've come out admiring those uh, hosts in a way that I never quite understood before because it's a real talent and a real skill to be able to keep things going and to make them uh, somewhat lively. Now, conversations about books are going to be somewhat more serious no matter what. But still, um, I think probably Tim Russert, even though I don't always like his his um, intense questioning. He is a, a really um, very dynamic questioner, and his eye contact is almost frighteningly intense. I really admire his work. As a radio host, I've always wondered how easy or hard it is to do the whole eye contact thing, and what's been your experience maintaining eye contact, learning to hold it on TV? It may be the single hardest thing because I tend, either out of early shyness or what I like to think of as deep thought and meditativeness <laughs> to keep my eyes down and that even more than most people. So it has been a real challenge to recall, to remember, to maintain eye contact in a direct way. And before the program began, I was already practicing with friends, many of whom thought I had gone insane <laughs> because they would say, why are you staring at me? And I would say, I'm supposed to learn how to keep my eyes on your eyes. And they said, well, it's bugging, you know, it's creeping me out. <laughs> and I would be staring at them like practically like a snake, and they would say, cut it out. But, but it didn't come naturally. That was very difficult. It's the single hardest thing. Uh, that, I take it, is an element of what you call artificial naturalness, perhaps. I'll just call it that. Now, what, what else is part of the whole artificial, natural persona that you had to develop? In order to make a conversation work as a performance and as a conversation, you have to compromise between the artificiality of keeping things going and, and possibly interrupting if people are going on too long, and then the natural atmosphere that you're trying to evoke, which is more like a dinner party where people get to chime in when they want and have a good time and so on. And I, I think probably maintaining an informal tone of voice has been very difficult for me, and I think it's my chief failing. I think probably I've erred too far on the side of formality and seriousness 
and in the last few episodes have tried to balance it with being more myself. Because after all, if I was hired on the basis of lunchtime conversation, one of the things I'd like to try to recreate is that sense of responsiveness and naturalness that was so, that was, you know, that's hard to do in a studio setting. Now, aside from just your own performance abilities, when you saw those first two episodes of Title Page, when you saw them in their final put together, uploaded selves, what did you think to yourself about, you know, this is good or this has to change? What was your impression of those first shows? Well, I did look up in the telephone book here in New York the uh, suicide hotline. <laughs> uh, I thought, oh my God. <laughs> you know the way people, many people feel about seeing photographs of themselves. No yeah. matter how flattering or good they are, people tend to cringe no matter what. They just don't view themselves that way. So there's that obstacle to get over. How, just the shock of the objectivity of a camera is weird, um, just as it is for still photographs. My response was in the, for the first two programs that there were some minutes, I would say even perhaps many minutes, where I thought I was doing a good job. And then there were many, many more minutes at that time where I thought I could have done better. And there were more minutes than I liked where I literally wanted to leave the room and hide. There was one point at which I nodded so vigorously in an artificial way that I almost fell out of the chair. <laughs> and it looked as if I were on a hunting trip with Dick Cheney. Oh, and, boy. and I was sort of ducking. <laughs> and, and I realized later that I was nodding like a madman and that I had to moderate that a little bit. Did you see, like ticks that you would do in your own life like we all have and we see them exposed when we're on camera or were they things that you were doing just because you thought you should be doing them when you're on TV? Um, well, I would say both. Uh, the ticks that I have, uh, I chew the ends of my glasses, the earpieces, and Odile and Lena, my co-producers, like that, but not to the point of turning it into like, a two, you know, shredding them. Um, <laughs> It was mainly a matter of overdoing that, that in our natural lives we tend to act in a, in a way that when we see it on camera, we would, in order to present ourselves differently, we would tone it down a little bit so that my nodding would be less vigorous, chewing on my glasses would be less like a beaver. The tendency I have to put my hands on my face, I would do less often. You know, you just you notice ticks that pass in ordinary life but that they're much more glaring in, when you see them visually. There's one more thing I wanted to know on this subject, and that is seeing you in the show and seeing pictures of you before, there's certainly a difference in appearance, and I wondered if they, they were giving you a certain look for title page. Yes, and it was a matter of some discussion, and I think it will continue to be. I think they wanted, I don't know, a more modern or, or a more sort of... Um, not sleek isn't the word, but a, a, a more sort of streamlined look. For one thing, this is for uh, mainly for computer use and computer viewing, and the kind of scrubby beard that I that I have <laughs> does indeed look basically like I haven't washed my face <laughs> on a screen. So, so they asked me to be clean shaven, and I agreed, and to wear certain clothes, and I agreed. I, I don't mind. I, I, I'm not sure that we won't have further conversations about that, but it was never bitter. I was willing to give it a try. Now, your own performance aside, what did you think of the show itself as a whole when you saw it? Well, it depends on what episode you're talking about. It varied two. from one to another. I would say all the way from disappointment in, in a couple of instances to... Uh, to satisfaction in a couple of instances, to great pride in a couple of instances. As I say, generally, over the course of the six episodes, we were all new at this, particularly me, and I think our learning curve was steep, but I think we climbed it pretty well, and I'm very proud of, of what we've accomplished, basically. I think also what's been interesting is to see some of the things that I felt were less successful being hit on, being clicked on more often than I would have expected. The second show in particular with four debut writers seemed to me to be a difficult one, but in fact the people out there in Cyberland seem to really like it, and it has grown in popularity, uh, which has been fascinating to me. Now about the conversations, that, the conversations themselves that you have on the show, 
They've come a long way in terms of the way they're structured. At first, it was mostly one-on-ones between you and between the authors individually. And now there's more group discussion. Is that a move that you've enjoyed to change it to a little more um, half and half, whereas half is you talking directly to the authors, half is the authors talking amongst themselves with you? That change is somewhat illusory. Um, We really have been doing more or less the same thing, but what has happened is that the editing has shortened when you go to the program online, we have edited down some of the one-on-one conversations to slightly more condensed versions. And what has happened at the end of the program is that as the four writers begin to talk among themselves and with me, it has become, maybe because I'm better at it, more spontaneous. And so we've kept more. Uh, Even though there isn't much more than there used to be, we've kept more. So the edited version of the program looks diff- more different from the earlier ones than it actually is, but that's only because we found a way, or we've all found a way, to make that last 20 minutes or so more enjoyable. Now, I suppose this would be a question that every interviewer thinks about, but how much do you know you're going to ask going in, and how many questions are improvised? I'd say about 50-50. I read every book quite carefully and take notes. I usually mark two or three pages to be read and to get a a writer response. But um, again, it's the learning, it's the same learning curve. I've learned more nearly to take off from what has been answered to a set question to an unset question. In other words, I'm listening more immediately to what someone's saying to me. And if I want to follow up in an unscripted way, an unplanned way, I'll do that more often. But I have a list of fallback questions in case something drags or in case I've forgotten something Um, that's very helpful because there are certain things I actually want to know. I try to get to as many of them as possible. I was just talking not long ago to a, a filmmaker who does short movies about books and authors, and he was describing that there are unique challenges to interviewing authors. What have you found in Title Page, talking specifically to people who make their living by not talking but by writing? What is that like compared to talking to other people? I I think that's a very good question, and and it's one that I've given a lot of thought to. Writers work in in a way that is, if not isolated, at least solitary, and their natures are often solitary. In the last 20 or 30 years, as the book business has become more and more promoted and, and, and more and more um, subject to public to PR, writers have had to learn to represent their works more publicly. I think it goes against their grain and always will, but they have gotten better at it and they understand the necessity for it in a media-heavy age. Um, but one of the young writers said something in answer to a question very much like this, that troubled me and that interested me. She said, very, very smart young woman. She said, um, you know, writing is an act of solitude to be shared with a reader, basically, in solitude. And to some extent, conversations about books and writing are, you know, a paradox because it's a, she used this phrase, it's a private transaction. Even though, of course, we all like to talk about books and uh, when we've all read them and have opinions and so on, the fundamental act of writing and reading is a solitary one. So it, it's, a, it's a real challenge to make that solitary transaction into a, you know, it's like having a book group. I don't know if you've ever been to one, but book groups themselves are often somewhat vexed in that people read alone and then they come together and they all have different opinions. But I do think there is such a thing as the community of letters, a literary community, even in the United States. I think we're trying to enhance that, and I think that um, it's a very worthwhile pursuit to, to at least moderate the solitude or isolation of writers and readers. What strategies have you and the title page crew come up with so far in filming these first six episodes to, to deal with that, to deal with making the private transaction of books of literature public? I I guess I would say that we've tried in every instance to address issues in the specific books that we're talking about that will be of general interest to a listening audience. Um, In one case, for instance, with uh, Richard Price's novel, Lush Life, 
it was interesting and important to me to know from him how much research he'd done in the Lower East Side and how, I mean, he's talked about it before, but in other words, you, you try to find something that's in the book that is literally part of the creation of the writer that also will not be highly literary and completely hermetic, but that will open out into interest among general uh, readers and, and viewers. Um, it's hard to say. You try to, wa you try to walk a tightrope between the between that private transaction, as we were just saying, and a public performance. I think there are other people who do it very, very well. I think Charlie Rose, is, when he's on, is very, very good at striking that balance. Now, you're someone who, in your entire career, you've been able to talk to writers, been able to talk to authors, been able to engage them in conversation. How does the position of talking to these authors as a show host differ from talking to these authors when you, when you say you're an editor and you, you happen to talk to an author, you happen to talk to, to an author in one of the positions you held before. How does it change this new well, that's, perspective? Well, that's an easy one. In one case, in the role of editor, generally speaking, we are involved in um, changing and revising and presenting and repositioning a manuscript or, or, a, or a set of galleys. And uh, my basic task is to try to persuade writers to make certain changes. Um, and my role as a host is not, is not, to, it's, that's not, it's not to do that. It's, it's a relief in a way because there's no, there's no sense of disagreement or adversarial, you know, no, I don't want that comma because guess what? The commas are already there. I, I ain't going to change them on the show. <laughs> so there's a fundamentally different purpose. One is, to help a writer be as good as he or she could be on their best day, writing a story, writing a poem, writing a nonfiction book, writing a novel, and having that back and forth, which is often highly technical and somewhat um, special. On the one hand, and on the other hand, simply taking what has already been done, what has already been created by that by those exchanges between an editor and a writer and trying to make it of general interest to a viewing audience and try to draw out the writer in things that he or she may not have thought of while writing the book but that have struck you while you read it. One's a persuasive thing, one's a persuasive activity, and the other activity is a more, um, is more a job of eliciting something from a writer. Do you ever find that nonetheless certain evaluative qualities of your editorial persona try to emerge while you're talking to authors on the show? They do, and I fight them down with a stick. <laughs> What's the point? If I have reservations about some of the books that I'm talking about, which I often do because I'm a very critical reader, the fact is we wouldn't have, as a group, have selected them unless we thought they were worthwhile in an important way. We're not interested in simply timely or, 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 or sensational publications. So our predetermination is that there's something really interesting or worthwhile about this book. The program is not the place to talk about a mixed metaphor. How involved are you in the book selection process? Are you one among equals, or do you have more say as the host who has to talk about the book, or is it... I'd say probably a little bit the latter, but basically it's collaborative among the four of us, and we have remarkably enough come to general agreement. I think probably among us, each of us would have one or two books which we would like to have seen but didn't invite, and each of us would have one or two books that we did have on the program that we might just as well not have had. But, but it's highly compatible so far. What would be the sort of book that you would like to see on there personally, but that doesn't quite work with the show's format as decided by the entire team? There truly are none. Oh. I would say, I mean, I, I hope that we, I, I admire anything that's done well on its own terms, even though I supposedly have a tiny reputation for literary sophistication. I actually have, for instance, great admiration for People magazine, uh, which I think is excellent of its kind. I like things that are well done on their own terms. So, I would like to have to talk to a really good diet book writer. I would like to talk to um, travel writers. I have no snobbery about the kind of literature I'm interested in. So I can't imagine, I hope very much that we'll have a chance to cover the whole 
spectrum. So far, we've been on the fairly serious literary side, but I'd like to have more humor on. I tell you, I, I can tell you one thing that we haven't had enough of from my own personal taste, and that is writing about science and medicine. And, and we all agree that we would like to have a program based on that theme. I think that would be an extremely fascinating show to have for science writers all there at once, and I'm sure that would be a great experience for you yourself, because I well, mean... Well, I'm, to I'm, I'm totally fascinated by the subject. I almost became a scientist and a doctor at one point. I read heavily in that area, and to have, to have the... I think I could really do a good job with, um, with such writers. I would love to do that. Would you be able to tell us what, say, a dream for writer scenario conversation wouldn't even have to be on title page, but of the for those four science writers that you would most like to talk to? Edward Wilson, Edward O. Wilson, Atul Gawande, who writes medicine for the New Yorker and has written two bestsellers, Steven Pinker, the philosopher and psychologist at MIT, and um, a woman named Katrina Furlick, who is a neurosurgeon and wrote a book called Another Day in the Frontal Lobe. I would call those four excellent choices. Now, getting back to the theme of fiction, since you've written fiction yourself, is there some element in your mind of comparing notes, you might say, when you're talking to fiction writers on title page? I think not. I think that because I was an editor for so long, I learned to compartmentalize my own work as a writer of fiction and nonfiction away from the writing and the writers I was working with. At the start, at the New Yorker in 1976, when I became a senior editor, I did have some difficulty. There was a static, if you will, set up like a feedback system where the speaker goes, Rah! <laughs> when I was working with writers and regarding my own writing, there was some sort of interference between the two. But after a while, I began to learn to separate them. And um, I, I, I would say, no. I mean, I think when I read fiction of any kind, I may be more aware of technique and structure than most readers are, simply because I've not, A, done it myself, and B, have worked with so many writers. But I can still just read a book if I set my mind on the right, the knob in my brain on the right setting. I can just read through something with pleasure and enjoyment. I've heard through the uh, word on the street that you're working on a new book about conversation due out in 2009. Is that true? Yes, it is. Now, what's the nature of that project? Well, I hope it's meant to be a, a combination of um, a good read and a, a somewhat literary read and a somewhat useful and practical book. If I had to pick a comp title, which is something you have to do in public when you're a publisher, even though I think every book, every good book is unique, nevertheless, your sales reps say, well, give us a model. Tell us what it's like. Very remotely, I would say E.B. White's, Strunk and White's Elements of Style, um, the, the famous writing instruction book, which is also an elegant essay all by itself. I'd like to help people understand what conversations are, according to my experience and long-windedness. <laughs> I would like to, I would like to give them some guidelines. I'd like to help them know, you know, how to change a subject. I'd like to help them understand the signals that we give each other about when it's okay to curse, because some people can handle that and some people can't. Uh, how to say hello, how to say goodbye. And it's aimed not at old friends, but at people who are just getting to know each other, either in a social or professional way, how to read signals and so on. It's based also to some extent on 10 years of psychoanalysis that I had and emerged from, I hope, in one piece and the better for it, where I began to understand that, that most conversations that last somewhere between about a half an hour and two hours have a deep structure um, that is not universal, but that is that has some common denominators, and also how to look back on a conversation once it's been done, and to see what you and the, your new, possibly your new friend, have actually, if there's a deeper theme that you've been talking about, and what that might be. Basically, to try to find, help people find out if they want to continue a relationship and how to and how to connect with somebody else. Now, deeper themes of a conversation, deeper structures. What do you think is 
the most important thing for people to know about conversation, or one of the most important, that they don't know already? Well, I think this has probably been said by many people far more expert than I, and that is that listening is far more important than talking. One hopes that it comes out to be about 50-50. And my feeling is that what conversation, by the way, hormonally, biologically, good conversation is known, has now been shown to release oxytocin, which is, a, which is what's called the trust hormone. When mothers nurse, their bodies release oxytocin. Uh, during sex, their oxytocin is released. And during good conversations, oxytocin is released. So the feeling of well-being, a feeling of having made a connection and being connected in the world to someone else, I think is very beneficial and healthy. And I think it's an underappreciated thing in our modern society, which is so pressed for time. I also think we learn more, more as much about ourselves by learning about others. Uh, and by opening ourselves to other people. Um, and I'd like people to, to understand that curiosity, uh, curiosity and candor are two um, really essential uh, ingredients for um, an enjoyable life. And I think a lot of us, unfortunately, are so hurried that we don't have time to stop. A lot of people feel that this kind of exchange between two people is a waste of time, and I would argue quite the contrary. I would argue that it's a waste of time not to do it. We ground ourselves, we find ourselves, we connect to others, we begin to also forgive and understand others, and thus by, by doing that ourselves as well. Now, you mentioned, of course, the, the lack of time people have today, and I'm going to go ahead and maybe ironically say that we're coming up on the end, but I want to ask you one more thing, and that is, how has your work on this conversation book interacted or affected with your work on title page and vice versa, or have they? I, I think it would be asking me to disentangle um, an undisentanglable knot. I think they <laughs> both work back and forth. It's like a feedback um, mechanism. I learn stuff on title page despite the artificiality of the naturalness <laughs> on the one hand. On the other hand, as I'm, as I'm working on the book, and especially right now reading uh, famous uh, essays and, and books of Jonathan Swift has a, has a wonderful short essay about conversation. I, I'm, they, they, just play in, they just play into each other. And I'll tell you another thing, although current evidence of our conversation, to the contrary notwithstanding, I've also learned a great deal both from title page and from my reading about, believe it or not, the value of keeping one's mouth shut <laughs> from the time to time. Of not talking, huh? From not talking and thinking and listening and apprehending, it is, um, and you know, I would congratulate you for, I think you, in the course of our talk, have both followed a set of questions, but also followed certain leads that I very much admire. Well, that's what I try to do, and thank you very much for the compliment, and thank you even more for taking the time to come on the program. My great pleasure. Thank you. Find out more about Title Page and watch the show itself at titlepage.tv. Our music is composed by Ben Althaus. Check out his website, Ben Althaus, that's B E N A L T H O U S E dot com. For more information and our online show archive, visit Colin Marshall Radio dot com. <laughs>